I started reading the Bible, but I just got lost in all the genealogy. You know, who begot who. Who was Melchizedek? Where did he come from? The book of Revelation just scares me. Does anybody really understand all those symbols? Who are the judges? Like, do they really matter? I've never understood which book came first. Is there a way to read the Bible so it makes sense? Welcome to Our Father's Plan. It's good to have you with us again. I'm Jeff Cavins, along with Dr. Scott Hahn. We're studying the Bible, and we are having a real good time uh, studying it. We have an awful lot to cover on this particular uh, show, this program. Uh, we're looking now into the book of Acts, and we're going to take a look at it in just a few minutes, but what do you have planned for this show? Well, I think we're going to have a three-fold presentation. First, I'd like to see you present the book of Acts as the introduction of the church as the fulfillment of salvation history, setting the program agenda for how the gospel goes from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the world. Then we're going to come back and discuss how the book of Acts reinforces certain Catholic perspectives, such as the Episcopal succession that is the basis of the church and its government. Then also how Peter's primacy was exercised in the early church in the opening chapters of Acts. And then also how the early church dispensed Christians from certain ceremonial laws that were a part of the Torah, the law of Moses. And then finally, we're going to come back and uh, address the question of Paul's teachings. What does Paul really believe and what does he assert about Scripture, about faith, about justification, about salvation, and how all of it fits into our Father's plan? So this is going to be a, a full show, and I think it's going to be exciting and filled with important content. And we urge you to get a pad and a pencil and a Bible and join us for our Father's plan. We'll see you back in just a minute. Welcome back to Our Father's Plan. Well, we're entering the last stage of salvation history, and that is the stage of the church. And that will involve the book of Acts, the last of our 14 historical books. Over my shoulder here, the 14 chronological books of Bible history. Specifically, we're in book number 14 right now. And it is within the book of Acts that you can really understand the rest of the New Testament. As I shared with you in our last segment, there are 27 books in the New Testament. And the book that gives us the history or the growth of the church after Jesus was living on earth is the book of Acts. And it's an exciting book. What I want to do is kind of break the book down for you so you can read through the New Testament a little bit more effectively. At the end of Jesus' life, we pick up with the book of Acts. And I want to read a couple of, of scriptures from chapter 1 to sort of set the stage. It says in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse uh, 4, And gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he had said, You heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. I'm at verse 8 now. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So Jesus tells the early followers to wait in Jerusalem, and they're going to receive power. Now, the Greek word for power is dunamis. It's where we get our word dynamite from. And so this is an exciting time. Jesus is saying, I want you to wait in Jerusalem, and you're going to receive dynamite. You're going to receive power for a purpose. And that purpose is to go out and evangelize, evangelization, to reach the world for Jesus Christ. 
You know, this is really a fulfillment of what we talked about clear back in Genesis chapter 12. There were three promises to Abraham. And the third of those promises was that through Abraham's seed, there would be a worldwide blessing. Well, here we are. We're experiencing the beginnings of this worldwide blessing now as Jesus has given commands to his disciples to go out into all of the world and preach the gospel. That's exciting. Now, the book of Acts is divided up, really, uh, the, the key to dividing up the book of Acts, the key to reading the book of Acts, is found right there in verse 8 of Acts 1. Let me read it again. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Now, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 gives us really three different locales. Locations. One is Jerusalem, where the disciples are at. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then, he says, you're going to be witnesses in Judea and Samaria. Now, Judea and Samaria, that's the region. Judea is the region around Jerusalem. And Samaria is a little bit further out. You may remember the hated Samaritans. Dr. Hans spoke about them a little bit in our last program. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. This is the fulfillment. This is the time. This is exciting. Now, the book of Acts is divided up according to those three segments, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's divide it up like this. Three parts. A witness in Jerusalem, chapters 1, verse 1, through 8, 5. That's the first segment of the, of the book of Acts, chapter 1 through chapter 8 and verse 5. And that, that covers roughly a, a two-year period from 33 A.D. to 35 A.D. And uh, the, second, uh, the second division of the book of Acts starts in chapter 8, verse 5, and goes to 13, chapter 13 and verse 1. That's the second section, and that's Judea and Samaria. So we start with Jerusalem, chapter 1 through 8, Five, and then we pick up with 8.5 to chapter 13 and verse 1 with Judea and Samaria. That's the second uh, aspect or the second portion of the book of Acts. The third is the witness to the end of the earth. And that is chapter 13.1 all the way through to the end, chapter 28 in the book of Acts. Now the first period covered, as I said, a period of about two years. The second period, Judea and Samaria, is about ten years. And the third section covers a time period of about 17 years. So we have a total there of about 29 years, the expansion of the church. Now it's in this third section that the Apostle Paul really comes on the scene. And uh, he goes out and he has three missionary journeys. These three missionary journeys are important to get a hold of. In the second missionary journey of Paul, he writes First and Second Thessalonians. But most of Paul's epistles uh, were written, all thir most of the 13 were written in this third missionary journey. Now, after Paul's second missionary journey, Paul started to have an awful lot of success with the Gentiles. As you remember just a moment ago, the uh, book of Acts and this explosion that takes place is in fulfillment of the, of, uh, the covenant with Abram, worldwide blessing. Well, Paul starts to reach many Gentiles. Up until this point, we're dealing primarily with Jewish people. But as you know, God's family plan includes all of the nations. But many of the Gentiles are being reached with the gospel. Cornelius was the first to be reached. Well, Paul started to receive a little opposition from his Jewish friends. What are we going to do with all these Gentiles coming into the church? We've had the law, we've had the temple, we've got the sacrifices, we've got the law of Moses, and now we have all these Gentiles coming in what are we going to do? Well, that brought about the first council in Acts chapter 15, the Council of Jerusalem. And the leaders got together and they decided on what they were going to do with the new believers. You can read about it in Acts chapter 15. Well, Peter presided and he finally made a decision that the, the Gentiles could come in. There were certain provisions, but here for the first time now we have Gentiles being introduced into the family of God on a large scale. Well, eventually the message got out to you. And the message got out to me, and we accepted the message. And we have become a part of the Father's plan. It's exciting. Let's take one more look at our Bible timeline uh, chart behind us before we talk to Dr. Scott Hahn. We started out in the history of the early world, 
We moved on through the patriarchal period, Israel and Egypt, conquest of Canaan, the period of the judges, the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, the exile, the return, and the Maccabean revolt. This took us through 12 of our historical books. And then we came to the New Testament. We have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And now our last section, the book of Acts. I like to think of the whole timeline as being sort of a, a rifle barrel. God has had a focused plan all this time. Very, very focused. It's like he shot the bullet through the rifle barrel, clear back there with Adam, the Proto-Evangelium, the first pronouncement of the Gospel. And the bullet went forth. And suddenly we come here to the book of Acts, and it's like a shotgun blast scattering at the end of the barrel. It's been moving along swiftly all this time, and suddenly, pow, the message goes out into all of the world. It's an exciting period. We're going to return in just a moment, and we're going to talk with Dr. Scott Hahn about a couple of concepts from the uh, New Testament period. I think you're going to be challenged. We'll be back right after this on Our Father's Plan. Welcome back to Our Father's Plan. Well, we just took sort of a little journey through the book of Acts and saw the three divisions of the book of Acts. It is the 14th of our uh, 14 chronological books. We're reading through the Bible in chronological order together. And uh, we're here with Dr. Scott Hahn in the middle of a conversation about the the, the book of Acts. Last program we talked a little bit about the New Testament. We want to continue that this week. You know, throughout the series, I have not said a word about your Bible timeline band, and I'd like to, I'd like to speak to it just a minute because I've seen my kids learn salvation history through this particular uh, tool. I've also had you speak now to my graduate students about this chronological approach to the Bible. I've had several students approach me and say, you know, I wish I had had this course before I delved in more deeply to the theology. The chronological and the theological really dovetail perfectly well. I remember coming away from a few conversations and talking to uh, one of my colleagues and saying, you know, I'd almost prefer not to teach Bible to people who have not been exposed to the chronological overview that uh, Jeff Cavins offers. So I really mean it when I say this, this approach, this tool is extremely useful. And uh, I know many thousands of people are going to find it indispensable to coming to better understanding of the Bible. Yeah, thanks for doing it. Good. Now, I would like to begin in the book of Acts too, taking the theological approach so that we can dovetail the chronological and the theological once again today. Great. One thing that stands out in my mind as I read through the opening chapter of Acts is the way in which Peter addresses the problem created by Judas's suicide, by the fact that uh, Judas is no longer one of the twelve, there aren't twelve anymore, there's eleven. Uh, and in Acts 1 verse 15 we read, in those days Peter stood up among the brethren the company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was guide to those who arrested Jesus. And it goes on talking about his, his demise. But now Peter quotes from the Old Testament there in Acts 1 verses 19 and 20. And we read, It was written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation become desolate, let there be no one to live in it, and his office let another take. Now there he's quoting from the Psalms, and he's saying, let his office, his office let another take. It's interesting that the Greek word for office is episcope. In fact, the uh, King James Version reads, his bishopric let another take. In other words, when one of the twelve apostles died, he didn't just die, he left a vacant office. Peter stands up, uses the Old Testament to explain ever so briefly what should be clear to all of the others and why it is they need to find a successor. No disputation. They understand Peter's statement. They understand the Old Testament background. They draw lots. They choose Matthias as Judas's successor. Now, Matthias is not one of the twelve apostles. Mm -hmm. So when we speak of apostolic succession, we're not talking about the successors to the apostles being the same as the apostles. That's why sometimes it clarifies things to speak of episcopal succession. That is, there is an episcopal office founded by Christ through the twelve apostles, and when those twelve apostles die, they're replaced. There is succession. And that isn't, that isn't argued. It's simply assumed and asserted, and then they get on with business. That one fact 
did a lot for me in dislodging uh, and disabusing me of many misconceptions about the Catholic Church's hierarchy because in fact the Bible shows us how the hierarchy of the church from the Pope on down, the Pope as the successor to the Apostle Peter and on down, all of that is really based upon the biblical institution of this office, this episcopate. A second thing that I also thought of in close connection with this is how in Acts chapter 1 Peter exercises his primacy, not in a tyrannical sort of way, but also not in a controversial way. It isn't as though Peter just stood up and expressed his opinion and then all the other ten apostles stood up and expressed their own as well. Mm -hmm. No, when Peter speaks, there's something definitive about his declaration. They simply act upon it. That isn't just true here in Acts 1. You discover in Acts 2 that there's another way he exercises his office, his primacy. When uh, all of the apostles in the upper room have begun speaking in tongues and the, the devout men and Jews in Jerusalem begin to question you know, what is this sound? What is this gibberish or whatever? In verse 14, Peter is the one standing with the eleven who lifted up his voice and addressed all the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. And he addresses some pretty strong words to everybody. He says in verse 36 as the climax, let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. I mean, here is Peter preaching the gospel with authority that he is wielding over all of Jerusalem, not just over the church. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do, brethren? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. You can already see the, the, the sacraments incorporated into the very essence of the gospel and our response to it. Uh, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in chapter 1 and here again in chapter 2 and once more in chapter 3 here is Peter and John going up to the temple at the ninth hour for prayer and they come across a man who is asking for alms, a beggar and Peter directs his gaze at him along with John and what does Peter say in verse 6? I have no silver and gold, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And so Peter, again, exercises the apostolic authority that is given to him, not only in healing this man, this lame man, but then in addressing all of the people who gather around these apostles. In the second half of chapter 3, he preaches a second sermon not just in Jerusalem, not just in the upper room, but this time in the very central precincts of the temple itself. And once again, we see in chapter 4, Peter exercising a sort of authority that as a cowardly fisherman a few weeks back, he never could have mm -hmm. dreamt of exercising. Here they are speaking to the people, and the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, annoyed because they're teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus. And here they are in the temple. And so they're drawn before, they're dragged before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish senators. Verse 5, on the morrow, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, John and Alexander, all of the real authorities in the Jerusalem establishment put Peter and John on trial, in effect, saying, by what name did you do this? And you, know, you might expect Peter at this point to begin defending himself. Well, look, you know, what I did is reasonable because of the following reasons. But he doesn't. He doesn't even recognize the fact that they are putting him on trial. Instead, he, uh, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a cripple, by what means this man has been healed, be it known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, ouch, <laughs> that would have been hard, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders. And he adds, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Here they see the boldness of Peter and John, and they hear the authority of Peter. And it's amazing because instead of defending himself on trial, in effect, he turns the tables right around mm -hmm. and puts these rulers, 
chief yeah. priests on trial. He puts the whole Sanhedrin on trial in effect saying, I have Christ's own authority. And as his vicar and spokesman, I am telling you, you've got to turn for the, believe. For the sake of our viewers who, who perhaps didn't hear the earlier programs, where does Peter get this authority? Yeah, if you go back to Matthew 16, when Jesus renamed Simon Peter, He's renaming him rock and says, and on this rock, I will build my church. And even more, he invests, Peter, with the keys of the kingdom in Matthew 16, 19. Okay. And he says, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. So the, so the choosing of Peter, Peter's authority, isn't a matter of Peter's charisma or the fact that he was very popular with the other disciples or that he was one of the first, but it has to do with Christ's appointment. Exactly. It's not Peter's interior fortitude. It isn't his strength yeah. of character either. Because you can see just a few verses later in Matthew 16, Jesus turning around and saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. You know, you're a stumbling stone. All right. So in himself, Peter's a stumbling stone. But united to Christ, the rock, Peter takes on Christ's rock likeness. So Christ can pledge himself to Peter and to all of us saying, on this rock, I will build my church. You look at Peter and you say, Good luck, Jesus. Then you look <laughs> at Jesus and you say, he can do it. Sure. If anyone can do it, almighty Christ can, and he has mm -hmm. for 2,000 years. And in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, and even 5, we see Peter exercising his primacy as prime minister over the other ministers in chapter 1, over Jerusalem in chapter 2, over illness and disease in chapter 3, over the Sanhedrin and the chief priests and rulers in Jerusalem in 4. And then he exercises this authority within the church in Acts 5. Ananias and Sapphira sell some of their land. They hold back some of the proceeds. And they lie to Peter and the apostles through their teeth about what their contribution to the church really consists of. And Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, where does Peter get off saying that Ananias has lied to the Holy Spirit? Ananias could have said, hey, Peter. With all due respect, I didn't lie to the Spirit. I just simply lied to you. <laughs> you know. But Peter's saying, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? It's a lot like the meekness of Moses in Numbers 12, 13, and 14, where Moses is accused of, of monopolizing authority. And Moses falls on his face. He's like, you're not attacking me. You're attacking the God who is within me, the God who gave me this position. I didn't ask for it. I didn't seek it. It's mine, but it's mine as a sacred trust. So you're not attacking me, you're attacking he who sent me. So Peter realizes that the authority you're questioning, the, the, the power that you're actually undermining is not mine, it's the Holy Spirit's. And so what happens when Ananias lies to Peter and thus the Holy Spirit? Verse 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And then a few verses later, the same thing happens to Sapphira. And in verse uh, 11, we read, And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. I Why? Guess. Because they recognized that Jesus didn't just leave behind a gospel to be preached, sacraments to be administered like baptism. He left behind an institution, a hierarchy, an apostolic organism that he invested with his own divine authority. And it wasn't, it's not something you want to play games with. You remember when, when Jesus said that he had to leave, but he was going to send the paraclete, the helper. In a sense, this is, this is kind of like that. Uh, Jesus has given the church leadership, and uh, these individuals in Acts chapter uh, 5 recognize that Jesus hasn't left them alone. He's here. Exactly. Through the leadership, as well as in the Holy Spirit moving through the leadership. That's right. And if we understand the leadership as covenantal, we'll see that it really is a kind of family hierarchy. Right. It comes from the Father in heaven, and it establishes spiritual fatherhood on earth. I'm reminded of Ephesians 3.14, where St. Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father in heaven, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named or derived. So we don't have fatherhood except that God the Father enables us to share in his own authority, his own love, his compassion, his pity, and his authority. So there we see how Christ establishes the kingdom of Israel in the church, the new Israel of the new covenant, a new kingdom, and he invests it as king with the authority of the prime minister, and then under Peter, the other apostles, and under the apostles, we discover in chapter 6, the deacons are appointed. So you have Christ, his prime minister, the apostles, and then under the apostles, you have the diaconate, and you're off and running through the book of Acts. 
as the early church spreads out and forms churches in other regions, they're all going to be organically united to Jesus through Peter and the apostles, the deacons, and the principle of succession as well, maintaining this down through the centuries. So the book of Acts starts off in <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 6. They ask the question, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Right. This, you're answering some of this. Exactly. And it's, it's important to realize, too, that an answer to that question is given later on in Acts 15. If you, if you turn with me to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, you see something very important. <clears throat> you remember that uh, when the gospel began to reach Gentiles for the first time mm -hmm. and they were baptized and incorporated to the church, you know, grave potential for schism and division arose because here are Jewish Christians who, after 2,000 years of exclusion from Gentiles, are now seeing Gentiles being included hmm. with equality in the church. Now, how does that work? That doesn't <laughs> seem to be a natural thing. And so there were all kinds of controversies. In Acts 15, verse 5, we read, some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter rose and spoke. Notice that in verse 7, there was much debate. But after verse 7, once Peter sure. stands and speaks, not one, not one word of debate is sounded again. Mm -hmm. Peter's definitive pronouncement resolves the matter. Now, someone may say that in <clears throat> verse 13, James James does stand up after this and says, brethren, listen to me. That's right. Let's take a look at that in context because Peter stands up and speaks saying, brethren, you know that in the early days God made choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. In other words, it isn't some second lieutenant who went out and brought the Gentiles in. It's the vicar of Christ. It's the mm -hmm. one through whom Christ has been exercising a certain kind of primacy. You know, you want to mess with me? <laughs> Think about Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira, you know. <laughs> it, it was through me that God, it wasn't me, it was God through me bringing these Gentiles in, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And God made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. You see the close link between faith and baptism and interior cleansing in Peter's theology. Verse 10, now therefore... Why do you put God to the test? By putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. What's the yoke? That's the question. You know, some people would say, well, it's the law of Moses. Yeah, but you can't say it's the law of Moses without distinction because Peter is not saying, look, we have not been able to resist the temptation to murder or to lie or to commit adultery or to covet, and now we're finally free from all those commandments. Hardly. <laughs> We are not allowed to lie or steal or commit adultery or murder. So what laws then are, you know, what, what laws does Peter speak of when he says this yoke that was upon the neck of our fathers, which they weren't able to bear, we have not been able to bear. If you go back several sessions, well, you can remember that we, fo we focused on the Deuteronomic covenant and all of the additional ceremonies, all the, diff the additional ceremonial laws that God imposed upon Israel after the golden calf because of their idolatry as a sort of penitential discipline that was to last until their hearts were cleansed by faith. These are the unique laws in Deuteronomy. That's right. The unique okay. laws first added in Leviticus during the 40 years of wilderness wandering. Then they became a permanent institution after the second generation's rebellion at Baal Peor in Numbers 25. Okay. From then on, in addition to the Ten Commandments, the simple law that had been given at Sinai before the golden calf, in addition to the, the Ten Commandments, there are all these additional penitential ceremonies added to Israel. These constituted a sort of ceremonial yoke okay. that really isolated and quarantined Israel from the nations because their holiness was much weaker than the sinfulness of the Gentiles. Now that's no longer true. It can be dispensed with. Right. The coming of the Holy Spirit has changed all that. In the Old Testament, if I touched a leper, I was unclean. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, if I touched a corpse, I, I was unclean. In the Old Testament, if I touched a menstruating woman, I was unclean. Jesus comes along, a leper touches him, he's not defiled, the leper is cleansed. Jesus touches a corpse, he's not defiled, the corpse is raised to life. 
Jesus is touched by a menstruating woman, a hemorrhaging woman. Mm -hmm. He isn't defiled. Her blood flow stops. The new covenant has come with Christ, and now the power of holiness greatly exceeds the power Beautiful. of sinfulness. Yeah. So all the walls of isolation and quarantine are torn down. And so Peter is saying, in effect, listen to me. These laws are no longer needed because the Holy Spirit has cleansed our hearts by faith and the Gentiles as well. So God has lifted this yoke from us, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear, and all the assembly kept silence. They listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done among them, through them, I mean, among the Gentiles. Now, James stands up and replies. He does not debate Peter's point. He just simply says, brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. And now he quotes Amos 9:11 in saying, God will return. I will return and rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen. What is the dwelling of David? The house of David. What is the house of David? The kingdom of David. What is the Davidic kingdom but the kingdom of God established with Israel through the Davidic dynasty, which had fallen into ruins for 500 years. But Amos said a time will come when God will rebuild the house of David. And James is saying, it's now. And we it. Okay. <laughs> the church is wow. the rebuilt Davidic kingdom. Can you imagine how exciting this must have been? For the Jewish Christians who've been waiting centuries, wow. they must have, I mean, they must have really been excited. So James is not contradicting Peter. He's just saying, look, as the one who is really tuned into the needs of the Jewish Christian believers, I want to give some suggestions as to the pastoral application yeah. of Peter's decree. Because he was the pastor in Jerusalem. That's right. He was the bishop of Jerusalem. Okay. And so he had that pastoral charge to maintain. And so he is the one who gives his judgment in verse 19, a pastoral judgment about how we ought to announce this with certain pastoral provisions to accommodate the people who are going to hear this message in verses 19, 20, and 21. We, we can't get into all of this, but it is enough to set the stage for something very important, namely the theology of Paul. Okay. Because when Paul proclaims the gospel, the decree of the Jerusalem Council is the foundational support for why Paul can go around saying, much to the, you know, much to the chagrin of the Judaizers, he is saying, now God, through the Spirit, in the New Covenant, by means of the sacraments, is bringing together Jews and Gentiles alike in the covenant family of God. You know what would be interesting to talk about in our next segment is to talk a little bit about uh, sola fide yeah. and sola scriptura. These are two hotly contested. Yeah, the two principles yeah. that split Catholics from so many of the people who are, you know, Protestants and fundamentalists for yeah. the last 400 years. We'll come back in just a minute and address this question, was Paul a Catholic and do his epistles really support the Catholic Church's teachings about salvation and justification? We'll be back with you in just a minute. Welcome back to Our Father's Plan. I'm Jeff Cavins along with Dr. Scott Hahn, and we're in the middle of a conversation right now dealing with Paul's theology. Uh, two of the words that people batter around, banter back and forth about are sola scriptura and sola fide. And Dr. Hahn is going to be addressing these two issues in uh, the context of Paul's theology. When Dr. Hahn refers to sola scriptura, that simply means scripture alone. And when he's talking about sola fide, that's faith alone. And these were two of the, the really hotly contested items in the Reformation. That's right. These are Protestant slogans that were used to justify the split from Rome that goes back to the 16th century. You know, and now, almost five centuries and 20,000 denominations later, we have to look at them in the light of Paul's teaching and see whether or not they're really justifiable from a scriptural standpoint. Uh, sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. Oddly enough, I used to teach it emphatically until I was asked by a student in a graduate seminar, where does the Bible teach it? And I looked and I looked, but I looked in vain. Never does the Bible say the Bible alone. The Bible does not teach the Bible alone. If you look at 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all Scripture is inspired of God, and it's profitable to equip the man of God for every good work. Sure, but it doesn't teach that the Bible itself is the sole authority in matters of faith 
and morals. I do believe that for me, the Bible was practically sufficient. But it was practically sufficient like the yellow pages are sufficient, you know. If you need a plumber, you look, up a, you look it up in the yellow pages, but you don't say, well, I found the plumber's number in the yellow pages, I don't need to call him. I got mm. the yellow pages, they're sufficient. Well, the Bible's practically sufficient to put you in touch with other sources of divine authority because St. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.15 that the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. Now, I can speak from you know, personal experience, if any text of the New Testament stated that the Bible is the pillar and foundation of truth, I would use that text more than all the others combined to have argued for sola scriptura, the Bible alone. But the Bible doesn't say the Bible is the, is the, the, the foundation and mm -hmm. pillar of truth. The church is, as the family of God, the household of faith. Furthermore, Paul states in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, that these Thessalonian believers are obligated to hold fast to the traditions that they received from Paul, either in writing or by word of mouth. So the inscripturated teaching of Paul bound them, but so did the oral tradition that Jesus had passed down through the apostles. That also bound the Thessalonian believers. And Paul nowhere hints that there will come a time when the oral tradition subsides and vanishes, but the written scripture abides alone. No, of course not. Uh, the scripture bears witness to the divine authority that Christ invested with the church and the equal authority of sacred tradition along with sacred scripture. So the scripture was sufficient for me, practically speaking, to point me to the church. Now, the second slogan, the second battle cry of Luther's Reformation was sola fide. That is, you're justified by faith alone, something he felt so strongly about Faith apart from works. You know, he once said from his pulpit in a sermon, I could commit adultery a hundred times in a day and it wouldn't affect my justification before God. Now, obviously he was given over to exaggeration and hyperbole, but that indicates, you know, a troublesome perspective. And it raises the question, did Luther get Paul right? For many, many years I thought so. But then I dug much deeper into Paul, especially Romans and Galatians, and most particularly, into the Old Testament background of Paul's teaching, because that's what Paul appeals to, to justify, to, to defend, to explain his own teaching about justification by faith. First of all, I should say, nowhere does the Bible say that we are justified by faith alone. In fact, Luther had to insert the word alone there into Romans 3.28, where Paul says, a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, Luther added the German word alone, so it would read, a man is justified by faith alone apart from works of the law. And Luther assumed that works of the law meant keeping the commandments, doing good deeds. Mm -hmm. And so a man is justified by faith alone apart from the commandments being kept. Are you saying that this idea of faith alone was Luther actually interjected? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had to insert that word into his German translation there in Romans 3.28. It's not there in the Greek, and nobody disputes that point. But even though he later, later was taken out, is that, is that right? Well, it's still in some translations to this day. Okay. In fact, the only time the phrase faith alone is used in the entire New Testament is when the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle James to write James 2.24 that a man is not justified by faith alone, but by works as well as faith. Now, somebody would say, wait a second, James has something different in mind when he says justification. I don't think so. I think James has something different in mind when he speaks of works, because in James chapter 2, what James is talking about is a faith that is dead, that is a faith without works. James 2.14, what does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but has not works, can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is ill-clad and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The works that James is speaking of, the corporal works of mercy, doing good to express love and keeping the sure. commandments. That's what James has in mind. So he is saying that a faith apart from works is dead and justifies no one.
I don't believe that James has in mind a different meaning behind the word justified then. I think he has a different meaning behind the use of the word works. Okay. If you go back to Romans chapter 2, you discover that when Paul is talking about works, he's using the phrase works of the law, and he is using it in connection with circumcision. And what verse are you in now? Well, in Romans 2, verses all the way from verse 25 to chapter 3, verse 1, okay. Paul is talking about circumcision over and over again, and what it means and what it doesn't mean, contrary to the Jewish outlook of his day. Mm -hmm. Then again in Romans 4, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, he returns to circumcision. He never talks about feeding the hungry or clothing the naked. Those aren't the works he has in mind. The works that Paul is preoccupied with are the ceremonial laws that the Jerusalem councils dispensed Christians from, specifically Gentiles, and most especially circumcision, because circumcision was sort of like the, uh, the, the right of entrance into the whole ceremonial system. Circumcision was to the Old Testament ceremonies what baptism is in the New Covenant. You can't receive the Eucharist if you're not baptized, but once you're baptized, you're obligated to confess your sins, to receive communion yearly, and so on and so forth. So circumcision is not only what initiated you into the Old Covenant, it's what obligated you to keep all of the Old Covenant ceremonies, such as the Seventh-day Sabbath, the animal sacrifices, the temple priesthood, the dietary laws, and so on and so forth, all of which we're dispensed and freed from by the Jerusalem Council, by the design of Christ, the authority of Peter. So Paul is talking about circumcision here. Now, in between Romans 2 and Romans 4, where he's talking all about circumcision and the works of the law that flow from it, he uses Abraham to prove his point. For instance, in Romans 4, verse 1, what then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham had faith, and he was justified. That's verse 3 of chapter 4. Now to one who works, his wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as his due. And to one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Now, anti-Catholics use these verses to argue that Paul uses Abraham to prove that you're justified by faith alone, apart from works, obeying the commandments. That can't possibly be what Paul is arguing. Why is that? If Paul's arguing from Abraham for justification by faith apart from any obedience, he has to wrench Scripture out of context. He has to misinterpret Scripture blatantly to do so because he quotes Scripture there in verse 3, Abraham believed God and he was justified. That Scripture is taken from Genesis 15 verse 6. Abraham believes God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now if Paul is arguing that this is the moment that Abraham was justified. That is, this is the moment Abraham became saved. This is the moment when he began walking with God. This is the beginning of his salvation, because that's how the Protestants conceive justification. They've got a, they've got a major problem, because it didn't all start in Genesis 15. In fact, it didn't even start in Genesis 14 or 13. You could go all the way back to Genesis 12 to discover when Abraham first began exercising a saving faith. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11:8 says, by faith Abraham obeyed when God called him. When did God call Abraham? Back in Genesis 12. When did Abraham first have faith then? Back in Genesis 12. So how can you say that Abraham isn't justified until Genesis 15 unless Abraham's justification is not what these anti-Catholics are saying. Abraham's justification in Genesis 15 could only be the moment of his salvation, the beginning of his salvation, if Paul is wrenching Scripture out of context mm, in a way that would have been completely unconvincing to the Jews who would have known the original context. Sure. They would have said, Paul, there's no way. Abraham's had faith since Genesis 12. Abraham is justified in Genesis 15. You're wrenching Scripture out of context. So how would a Catholic explain Paul's use of the Old Testament? Very simply, if Paul is arguing that Abraham was justified by faith prior to being circumcised, then Abraham is an example for all of us 
to show that Gentiles don't need to be circumcised in order to be justified. Why? Because Abraham, the spiritual father of the Jews and the Gentiles, experienced the same thing. He is declared justified in Genesis 15, but he wasn't circumcised until Genesis 17. Mm. And so Paul is arguing from the original context of Genesis, not to argue that Abraham was saved by faith alone apart from obedience, but to argue that Abraham was saved by faith apart from circumcision and all the other ceremonial works that flow from it. If that's Paul's point, then A, he's respecting the original context, B, he is drawing proper conclusions, and C, he is supporting the Catholic Church's teachings. Because at the Council of Trent, Session 6, Chapter 4, this is exactly how the Catholic bishops interpreted Paul. Paul is not arguing that Abraham was justified by faith apart from obedience. He was justified by faith apart from the old covenant ceremonies such as circumcision that did not really bring grace. Now somebody could say, wait a second, later on in Romans, Paul talks about covetousness. For instance, in Romans 7, he's speaking about the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. You know, and so Paul is thinking of more than just the ceremonial law when he speaks of the law. But notice what Paul doesn't do in Romans 7. He doesn't say, because we have problems with coveting, we're dispensed from the prohibition against coveting. He never dispenses his readers from the prohibition against coveting what belongs to your neighbor, but he does dispense Christians from circumcision and from animal sacrifice and the dietary laws and the temple sacrifices and all of the rest. Why? Those are the old covenant works of the law. And in fact, just recently, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found this document, MMT. Just in the last five or six years, a revolution has begun because all of a sudden we discovered that works of the law was a stock formula or phrase commonly used back in the first century by the Jews to refer to the temple sacrifices, to circumcision, and to the other ceremonial laws that were identified with Israel as a ethnic nation. But all of that has been transcended by the new covenant. Now we've, in effect, been raised beyond that to a truly Catholic kingdom. And this is Paul's point then. And I want to emphasize this because there are people out there, I mean, brilliant and sincerely godly men who are preaching on the radio and the television Mm -hmm. that Catholics are not saved because they don't believe in justification by faith alone. What do we say? We have to say the Bible doesn't teach it. Nowhere is the phrase used, we're justified by faith alone. The only time the Holy Spirit inspired a New Testament writer to use the phrase faith alone is James Mm 2.24 when he says we're justified but not by faith alone. A man is not justified by faith alone. So why would people define justification so narrowly as to exclude what James means by the word justification as the Holy Spirit led him to use that word? We should be able to stand up and say just with the Holy Spirit and the Apostle James, a man is justified by faith and works. And in fact, that's exactly what Paul says in Galatians 5, verses 1 through 7. He's talking about how we're saved by faith working in love. You know, and this all fits with our program, our Father's plan, because the primary model of the covenant is not the courtroom, where God is a judge issuing judicial decrees, you know, regarding guilty defendants who are set free because of Christ. You know, there are partial truths in those phrases, but... It's misleading without the whole truth. The Mm -hmm. whole truth is found in Paul and the Catholic Church. The whole truth is this. The covenant needs to be understood primarily as a family model. God's judgments are fatherly judgments. Now, that doesn't imply a lesser or lower standard of justice because a father requires more from a son than a judge does from a defendant or a lawgiver from citizens. So when God justifies us, when he declares us to be just, that judgment is a fatherly act. And so when he justifies the ungodly, he doesn't leave us ungodly. God couldn't do that. When God says something, when God declares it, he does it by declaring it. God can't say something and then have that not be true. You know, we think that that God wouldn't lie because it's the wrong thing to do. That's true, but God couldn't lie. If God said, Jeff Cavins, you're a cat 
you all of a sudden begin to meow. Mm. God's word is what brought the world into being out of nothing. So when God speaks his word and declares us just and righteous, when he justifies the ungodly, we're not left ungodly. Some people say, well, he justifies the ungodly, so we're still ungodly. No, it's sort of like a minister who marries a bachelor. Well, once the bachelor is married, he's no longer a bachelor. Once the ungodly is justified, he is transformed by the, the powerful word of God's judicial declaration that comes from the Father who says, you are just with the righteousness of Christ, my son. You are now my child. We're sons in the eternal son. In, in, That's in reality. That's right. It sounds like the difference between a cover-up versus an inside job. Yeah, a kind of legal fiction on the one hand. Yeah. God says, I'll pretend you're just even though you're ungodly against a reality. You know, 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2, see what love God has shown us, yes. that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Now, I couldn't adopt my dog and say, this is my son, because to father means to communicate your nature. So if God is justifying us and making us his children, he regenerates us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. He communicates to us his own nature. Second Peter 1, 4, we have been made partakers of the divine nature. We share in the divine life of Christ's sonship. Yeah. That's how session six of the Council of Trent defined justification. And St. Paul would have said, yea and amen, preach it, Catholic bishops, because that is what echoes the truth. And the truth is the truth of the covenant. You know, we go back to the foundational principles of this whole 13-week-long uh, series that God is our Father, that salvation is the gift of Christ's own divine sonship, that the covenant is what binds us as God's family, and that the church is God's new covenant family. Not simply an earthly or human family. The church is what enables us to share in the life of the eternal trinity. If we could grasp the significance and truth of that, it would transform our lives. Not only our prayer and study, but the way we work, the way we get along in our families. Because in the home, we're called upon to image God, who is an eternal family. So I want to leave you with this thought. Turn to God in prayer and open up the scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you our Father's plan and then celebrate what it means to be a part of the Catholic family of God and share it with as many people as you can. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our Father's Plan. We're going to come back next week for our last installment in the series. Pray that the Lord opens up the treasures of what it means to be His family. God bless you. <laughs> Nostra stebre cazzi oh.